are going to dive right in right now to um, H-492. Um, Luke, if you could join us. I, um, I call this a markup session, and what I really wanted to be able to do was um, I, I did ask, the first thing I want to do with this bill today is I had asked um, Luke Marlin to come in with a new definition of home, what homelessness is, or, or not new, but just the an alternative. Right now, we have in 492, the definition of homelessness is tied into the federal de uh, definition of homelessness, which is pretty lengthy. But also, we were advised, I believe, by the um, by um, Human Rights Commission, perhaps that uh, referring to federal statute for this may not be the best idea, just because federal definitions can change uh, without our approval. And so yeah. um, I asked Luke to come in with different language that we can consider, but also and, um, to go through the sections of the bill again, just very quickly to say, and to ask the committee, did we have questions about any sections of the bill that we can address um, while we have Luke's time? Um, so. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Luke Marland, the Director of Ledge Council and Chief Counsel of the General Assembly. I'm here in H-492, and it's good to see you all again. Uh, the Chair had asked me to reference any definition of homelessness in state law. And if you remember when I did the walkthrough, I think it was a couple weeks ago at this point, maybe two or even three weeks ago, I mm -hmm. read for you the federal definition, which indeed is long. And then I read to you some language from Title 16, which is education. And let me read that to you again, because it's not really a definition of homelessness, but it is indirectly. And let me re remind you of that language, because that is language you could use if you wish to. So this is existing state law. And once again, you don't have to follow existing state law, but it's often a good jumping off point. So you could modify this definition, if you will. It was in Title 16, and 16 BSA 10075. And this is in the context of school kids and where they go to school. And there's language about child of homeless parents. And let me read that to you again. A child of homeless parents means a child whose parents, one, lack a fixed, regular, and adequate residence, or two, have a primary nighttime residence in a supervised publicly or privately operated shelter for temporary accommodations, such as public assistance assistance hotels, emergency shelters, battered women's shelters, and transitional housing facilities, or a public or private place not designated for or ordinarily used for a regular sleeping accommodation for human beings. So this was a language that we looked at a couple weeks ago. It's in Title 16. Also, you can see that it could be very easily changed to a definition of homelessness or homeless uh, status, and it does actually track some of the same language in the federal statute. For example, a place that's not ordinarily used for uh, human beings to sleep at night tracks some of the federal law. The shelter language tracks some of the federal law. So it's different then, but somewhat similar to the federal definition. So if you want to use this as a jumping off point, I think it would be very easy to do so, to simply take that language and make it the definition of housing status. Yes. So the last definition of a uh, place that is not normally used for human habitation or whatever that is. Regular sleeping accommodation for human beings is Right, the, yeah. okay. So would that, in your opinion, would that be like a barn or um, some kind of an outbuilding shed? Yes, unheated, absolutely. Like that, would be, a, that would be what? A, a car. If you're sleeping in a place a that car, yeah. isn't normally understood to be a place that uh, people yeah. would okay. sleep in. Okay. Overnight. Yes. So this is, and this definition is is assigning this definition to the child's parents. Correct. So and, and so it gets us part of the way there in terms of what homelessness can be defined as. Uh, I would think it gets you if you like this definition. Once again, you could have your own definition. You could modify it. That's up to you guys. Yeah. But I think it gets you 99% of the way there if you like it. For example, using exactly the same words, but fitting it into 
the terms that are used in your bill. Housing status, this would be how it would be used in your bill if you wish to do that. Housing status, which is a key term, as you remember, in Title IX and the other statutes you're modifying. Housing status means the status of lacking a fixed, regular, and adequate residence or having a primary nighttime residence in a supervised publicly or privately operated shelter. So this is taking the same language. Um, such as public assistance hotels, emergency shelters, battered women's shelters, and transitional housing facilities, or a public or private place not designated for or ordinarily used as regular sleeping accommodations for human beings. So that's taking the same language from Title 16, putting it in the manner that you would have it in this bill. And the federal delegation, uh, the federal definition had um, also had elements of perception. Is that right? Where uh, let me pull that up for you. Let me let me look. So the federal definition is referring to the federal law. Would be. For example, an individual family who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, similar to what I just read you. An individual or family with a primary nighttime residence that is a public or private place not designated for or ordinarily used as a regular sleeping accommodation for human beings, very similar to what I just read you, but they give examples, including a, a car, park, abandoned building. Uh, an individual or family living in a supervised, publicly or privately operated shelter, once again, similar to what I just read to you. An individual who resides in a place, I'm sorry, in a shelter or place not meant for human habitation <coughs> and who's exiting an institution where he or she was temporary, temporarily resided. So it's phrased a little awkwardly, but that's a little different than what I just read to you. Is that someone coming out of I would, yeah, jail I, or? I would think so, jail, uh, jail uh, psychiatric facility, some other kind of yeah. um, involuntary status, yes. So a lot of it tracks, in some way, the state language that I just summarized for mm -hmm. you. It's longer, and they include some other things also. So. Is it possible to get a copy of that wording on our iPads? Of which, which wording, the federal or the state? Or? State. Well, actually, both. Oh, sure. Both so, help. well, yeah, state, you can I, look up. I prefer to read uh, absolutely. something rather than hear it. So, federal, I can, can email to you. State, Thank you can you. look up right now. I can give you a citation okay. on the website. Uh, it's 16 VSA 10075. So, if you go to the website under Vermont Statutes, you can look it up. Putting it all together, I didn't know if the committee wanted to do that. If they do, uh, I can plop that language into the bill and you can look at it and decide how to modify it. So mm -hmm. absolutely we can get it to you in Thank you. the different ways. If you tell it to me, I can go ahead and post it to me. Okay. You're talking about the, uh, the Vermont, Vermont statute? Vermont, <laughs> Vermont statute just wanted you pull it up from the website. It's 10, the 16 VSA 10075 under Vermont laws. I'm, a, I'm in statute search. And then you go to Vermont laws, pull it down. Yep. And then go down, Title 16, and then pull that up. Under the education or the Education. And then go all the way down to 10075. You went a little too far, I think. 10075? 1075? 7, 1, 3, 1, 25, yeah. 10. Then 10075, click on that. Okay. And that's it. Then you go all the way to E as an echo. And if they can see it on the screen, I will show them. Right. Right. I will post this right now. Thank you. Um, okay. So we'll have that posted to look at. Um, Representative Kalaki. In the Vermont language, I'm just wondering that, as I was listening, when I visited treatment court in both Barrie and Burlington, it was a lot of kids uh, that were in the system were couch surfing, and they really weren't. And so mm -hmm. they were not considered homeless, but they were homeless because they, they and they were having real troubles and with the, saying to the judge, you know, look, it's when I walk out on Church Street today after I leave you promising to be good, I have to find a place to stay tonight, and I couch surf, and sometimes I make bad mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, will that fit in the, our Vermont edition? 
I think I think it's arguable that definitely would lack the fixed right. regular residence that would seem to fit. Now, some of this, what you're talking about, is how a court would interpret it, yeah. how an agency or department would do the rulemaking to apply it. Mm -hmm. So, I can't comment on that, but it would seem to fit within that language. No, I, th I, I think that's good because when we get our count, it's a thousand people who are living not in any kind of shelter, and so we, you know, to get. All the couch, I get such a bigger universe. So, if we're going to have a Bill of Rights, these kids, well, these people, it's not just kids. Uh, great. I think, I think a good argument would fit with that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I guess there's another general con uh, concept here. We were, we were talking about um, last week in the conversation the difference between someone who is homeless. And someone who's perceived to be homeless. Yes. Um, how is that covered? Well, I had received an email from one of the witnesses, and I think uh, you were on that email. I don't know if the rest of the committee was, so I was CC'd on it and not respond to it. I think that witness was suggesting that perceived be added. That's a decision right. for the committee to make. Yeah, I mean, so, we, had, we had a conversation about the yeah. difference between. Again, that, 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 that a discrimination, an act of discrimination can happen because of perception. So as the um, state potential definition that I read to you does not include the word proceed. So obviously the difference is actual means you are in that status. So that would have to be demonstrated. Perceived means that someone thinks you're in that status. So it expands Mm -hmm. the universe of people who would be covered by the anti-discrimination law yeah. or uh, in the so-called homeless bill of rights to expand that also. So. Okay. Representative Zahn. If in the bill is introduced, uh, section 274, subsection D is where the word received appears. And, and I had raised a question about that because it was used in that one subsection, but not, it wasn't used consistently, yeah. consistently throughout the rest. But it, it is covered in there. It's just covered in one subsection instead of all of Well, in that part, so yeah. Yeah. you're absolutely right. You could catch it. Um, but in the, the amendments to the existing anti-discrimination laws in Title IX, the word received is not used. So that's a policy decision that we have. We, well, we have to make a decision on when we see. We can look at both definitions side by side. We'll take. We'll, we'll have a conversation about the federal definition and the, and the ones that you brought forward from education. Yep. And we'll see. We'll have a conversation about which one we would like to pursue. Okay. Um, I think that's the best way to handle that percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that part of the bill. Um, Lisa. Um, just a quick note that this came up at a school board meeting mm -hmm. um, the other night that homelessness is going to be very important to define in terms of education because of residency yep. in various school mm -hmm. districts. Sure. And we're, in my district, we are facing that, that um, we don't really know whether a student is a resident and needing to be educated in that district. Sure. And that's what I read to you from Title 16 yeah. is in that context. So I, I can't say how it's applied. Right. So I, that, I don't know that's why it, I but that, that's that where it's in the context of what school district the kids would uh, attend because mm -hmm. it's in the context of a child of homeless parents. So. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's where the, the link here and the connection to the McKinney-Vento Act mm -hmm. also um, plays into the issue of, of how kids can be educated and how that works. Um, so let's start. Well, so let's just track now the rest of the bill. Sure. And um, and see where we are on particular sections here. Um, and how would you like me to do that? Do you want me to just? Say well, we're looking this at isn't the three, findings or what? How would you like well, to this, see? Well, yeah, let's do this. There's three distinct sections of the verse. There's, yeah, there's three distinct areas in the bill. There's the findings, there's the Bill of Rights, and then there's the uh, addition, there's the protected status um, towards the end. There may be more there, which I guess we'll go through. But I, that, So let's do finding. Let's just consider what the findings are. Um, determine whether or not we think it's 
necessary. Come on in. Where's the way in there? Yeah. This one just. Just well, I don't know. No, that was pretty intentional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It might be the cigarette person. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We're, yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Take a one on the back here. <laughs> so what do we have? So we have just a short list of findings. This committee, this is open to your conversation. Do you have an opinion on? the findings that have been proposed here. And there's one more finding on the next page. There's a total of three. right to the next section. So I, I guess uh, Article 1, Chapter 1, um, the monitors are equally free and independent. Does that really speak to or cover what we're doing here? Is Article is 7, Chapter 1 sufficient? I guess that's when I was reading it, that was what I was thinking. Well, is the key word here equally? It could be. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All the monitors are, are equal in terms of uh, season three and independent. Uh -huh. Yeah. But I do have a good question. How relevant is it? Well, because Article 7, Chapter 1 is that uh, all the monitors are entitled to the same benefits and protections. Mm -hmm. So isn't that where we're going with this? Um, I, again, I'm just putting it out there. I don't have a problem with this thing then. <clears throat> Again, findings are some things that we tend not to do a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're merely a, a statement. A statement. I, I was going to say an amuse-bouche. It's just sort of a, you know, just sort of a presentation of, what's, of what this bill is dealing with and why this bill came forward. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, Tom. I think if uh, when Bor Yang said we should might consider also the perception of, um, so if, if that is true, I, if we take that later on, if to include that, then the intent of this act, people without homes of the perception of, would have to probably go there as a finding if we're defining legislative intent and we include that. So are you talking about page two, line number three? Line three? Yes. If we go, if, if remember, yeah, we, when Boris said. The Human Rights Commission testified that it was important yes. to, to include the intent of what we're seeking to do yes. through the findings. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that would just be a flag if we, when we make that determination. So. So if we were to include language that had the word perceived in it online, it would be on line four that says um, people without homes or perceived to not have homes. Yes. <laughs> Strikes me as redundant, but... Well, again, this is the the importance of the word perceived in terms of, right. again, again, based on the testimony that we received. Is it mm -hmm. something that um, like the example was if I was homeless and, and you were not and you were treated as if you were? Mm -hmm. That would be a perception. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll agree with that. Yes. So I understand the reason for wanting to include the word perceived. Um, and on the face of it, I don't feel there's an issue. But um, there could be a situation where there's an objection to a person being wherever that person is. And the, re and be and the reason 
has nothing to do with a perception that the person is homeless, but has to do with something else, which is not necessarily against the law, activity or what have you. Mm -hmm. And so if you have the word perceived in there, that could be used uh, as an accusation <coughs> against, that person could use that word uh, as a reason for pursuing some sort of uh, redress when that is not the situation. So I think it can make it more, it can make it more difficult um, to address a situation where it's not the basis of perceived homelessness, but something else. It could, I, I'm, I'm just concerned about that, because it's perceived is pretty open-ended. I mean, it's, it looks, it looks very um, uh, self-descriptive, but not necessarily. So it's something to consider. Right, no, I believe so. People have, I think that the key element is to remember that this doesn't prevent somebody taking care of them in a normal course of business, right. you know, if there's behavior that is not related or linked to, I mean, it could be, I mean, it's just that idea of, I mean, I hear what you're saying, perceived does broaden. It's very broad. It, it does broaden the, 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 the notion here. Um, right, you could, you could as, as a, uh, a merchant, you could be accused of uh, being prejudiced against someone because you perceive them, because that person perceives them as being homeless when in fact it isn't, and yet, it have, could be related to um, actions which are not necessarily someone breaking the law that would, the actions would be covered under some sort of civil law. Well, it's right. just, it's very murky. I understand the reason, and, and, but, it, but there's always an unintended consequence to things. So I think before right. inserting that, we really need to Fresh that out a little bit more right, because it's an interest of fairness. You want to be fair to someone who is, um, if not homeless, certainly looking and or acting in a, in a manner that would lead one to think that they might be homeless. But you don't want to, um, you, so you want to protect their rights as human beings. You want to do that. Right, and but. this goes to, I mean, this, I mean, it could go from anything from me having a really bad week and not, not, you know, cleaning myself and not shaving and not, you know, whatever, and right. being perceived that way. But the, I think the more realistic the view is, is the gentleman who testified who was homeless for 10 years and hasn't, you know, he was homeless for 12 years in his last stretch and hasn't been for 10 years, but maybe everybody knows that person as a homeless person and perceives will perceive him to be homeless, even though he's, as he self-describes, is formerly unhoused. Um, so it, it's it, again, these are the, this is the reason to to, to discuss this um, it, here. It seems like question would be in the scenario that you present is that, it, as Tom said, if if a disheveled person run, walks into a store and is perceived to be a homeless person, and is asked to leave that store. That is outright discrimination yes, um, because of the perception yes. that that store owner had of that individual that walked into their store. So I think that's what we're trying to address here, that, that still blatant discrimination. So we're looking to protect homeless people from that. So that perception may be based right. on And place. even the general public. I mean, just because you might look what is mm -hmm. stereotypically associated mm -hmm. with someone who is homeless. Doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I mean, that's my thought. I mean, anybody. I mean, you can. I mean, you come into my cafe sometimes, and you, like, if you take a look at like people sitting at a communal table, you have no idea which one is like a low-income, you know, employee at one of the farms or owns like a two million dollar house on the lake in Manhattan. It's all perception. Represent us not. Well, and the flip side of not incorporating the the language around perception is 
then you allow, if a case comes before the courts, for the person who was discriminating to say, well, I didn't know they were homeless, so I wasn't discriminating them on them on the basis of them being homeless because I had no way to know one way or the other. It gives, because if, you, if it's purely on their housing status, then, then you have to make a case that this person knew where this person was sleeping at night, which seems to me a very difficult case to prove and not what we're trying to address in the situation. Mm -hmm. And as an example that we heard last week, too, we really don't want to be in a situation where I perceive that John is Muslim uh, because he's wearing a Sikh um, head headscarf, and I, and I discriminate against him. But because I didn't, I, I mistakenly discriminated based on his religion. We don't want to exempt that behavior, and so adding perception is really important because I perceived him to be Muslim, even though he wasn't. And we want to make sure that that kind of behavior is. Ca I think I think that's what we want to capture in this bill is that that kind of behavior is captured, and if we leave out perception, then we allow for this kind of, this sort of escape clause to come in and be used. Yeah, and just, yeah. I'm sorry, while we have a pause, while we have a pause here, it looks like we're being visited by students who are wearing VSAC sweatshirts. Um, you guys are, are college students or college students to be? Did we start a college program so yeah. in ninth grade? <laughs> wow. um, Maybe we should. Well, welcome. If you, if you haven't caught the drift, we're talking about a homeless bill of rights here. Um, and note how we just spent seven to eight minutes talking about what the word a word, and the importance <laughs> of adding a word to legislation can be. I mean, this is, um, yeah, you know, this is one of the things that we do here. Um, so if you're not up on your vocabulary, if you don't like vocabulary, start, because uh, the definitions of words are clearly very important. Uh, saying what you mean and meaning what you say is always a difficult thing to get across in, in, in statute sometimes, and, and that's, what we're, that's what we're discussing this morning. So welcome, enjoy. Yeah. Um, do you have something to give us? Is that what you're, oh, okay. Just observing. Okay. Oh, good, okay.